Okay, so what you have here is the first in a series of four PowerPoints on biotechnology. This coincides with chapter 20 in your textbook. Each PowerPoint will get deeper and deeper into the world of biotechnology. You've been provided with your versions of the PowerPoint, and I would like you to fill them out as you go along. So pause where you find necessary. So biotechnology um, often brings up lots of questions and intrigue as we learn more and more about the ways that we can manipulate genes, such as using it to identify true suspects um, and criminals in cases, manufacturing human insulin, various forms of rice, human genome project, making parts of animals glow that didn't otherwise glow. Very interesting stuff. Now the human genome is pretty huge, 3.2 billion bases, and chromosomes of course vary in their size and their structure. Here you can see the banding pattern which has to do with their genes, where they are. Biotechnology today is sometimes called genetic engineering, and really this means manipulation of DNA. If you're going to engineer DNA and genes and organisms, then you need a set of tools to work with. So this unit is really just a survey of those tools, and here is our toolkit. Well, kind of. But first we need to review bacteria, because that's really where our work begins. Remember, they're one-celled prokaryotes. They reproduce by the process of mitosis, but really we call it binary fission with bacteria. They grow very quickly. In fact, they can have a new generation approximately every 20 minutes. And just overnight, they're going to have 100 million in their colony. They are the dominant form of life on Earth, while we don't give them the respect that they deserve, and of course are incredibly diverse. So let's take a look at the bacterial genome. Remember that they have, and first of all, remember that a genome is just all of the DNA of an organism. They have a single circular chromosome, they're haploid, and their DNA is naked. They don't have the histone proteins. They have just 4 million base pairs, about 4,300 genes, 1 in 1,000 DNA in eukaryotes. <clears throat> so how on earth have they gotten so diverse when you contrast that in eukaryotes there are 1,000 times more DNA and 10 times more genes? Remember we've about the introns, the spacers, and inefficiencies. Remember that transformation experiment where the heat killed pathogenic bacteria and the non-pathogenic bacteria mixed and what happened to the mice? They died. Well, bacteria are opportunists. They basically, well, or are they promiscuous? They pick up naked foreign DNA wherever it may be hanging out. Kind of not a good idea if you're a human. They have surface transport proteins that are specialized just for the uptake of naked DNA. And what they're doing is they're importing bits of chromosomes from other bacteria. So this is one way of varying their DNA without dealing with sexual reproduction. Here they can incorporate the DNA bits into their own chromosome, therefore expressing new genes. This is called transformation and you should know what this is, and it simply is a form of recombination. Now a certain bacteria, E. coli, is used a lot in biotechnology, but E. coli actually lacks this specialized mechanism. However, it can be induced to take up small pieces of DNA if we culture it in a medium that has a high concentration of calcium ions, therefore we use this technique a lot to introduce foreign DNA into E. coli. Now these little bits of DNA that are floating around are called plasmids, and they're super small supplemental circles of DNA. They're kind of like tiny chromosomes. They are between 5,000 and 20,000 base pairs and are self-replicating. They carry extra genes between 2 and 30. And often, these genes are for antibiotic resistance. Think about that for a moment. They can be exchanged between bacteria. So it's kind of like bacterial sex, which would allow for their rapid evolution and hard to keep up with. They can be imported from their environment. So here is a way for bacteria to get new genetic variation without true sexual reproduction. So how can plasmids help us? It's a, there's a way for us to get genes into bacteria easily. We can insert a new gene into a plasmid, and then we can insert a plasmid into a bacteria, and we call this a vector then, the vector that carries the gene that we want. The bacteria now expresses that new gene, 
and the bacteria will now make that new protein for us. So with a diagram, we cut the DNA, not really with scissors. Then we take that gene from a different organism that we want to make more of, and we glue, not with Elmer's, that new little section of a gene that we wanted. And so here we have our recombinant plasmid, or our vector. And that's our glue DNA. And then here you have your transformed bacteria with that gene in it that we were interested in. So in biotechnology, we use plasmids to insert new genes into bacteria. We take the gene that we want, such as insulin, human growth hormone, lactase, we cut the DNA, we cut the plasmid DNA, and we insert the gene that we want into the plasmid. In other words, we glue them together and we, with a ligase and we end up with a recombinant plasmid. Do we have DNA scissors? No. We use restriction enzymes, otherwise known as restriction endonucleases. We've talked about that a little bit. This was actually discovered in the 1960s and evolved in bacteria to cut up the foreign DNA so as to restrict the action of the attacking organism, to limit it. This was a protection against viruses and other bacteria. Bacteria protect their own DNA by methylation and not using the base sequences that are recognized by the enzymes in their own DNA. Now, take a look at these phrases and what do you notice? <clears throat> They're palindromes. They read forward the same as they read backwards and they get more complicated. If you want to play with that, you can pause for a moment. So with this idea of palindromes, restriction enzymes have to do with the action of the enzyme. They cut the DNA at very specific sequences. Take a look at these two. This is called a restriction site. They are symmetrical palindromes. What they do is they produce there we go, there's our cutting. So notice that they're cutting at the palindromes and you're gonna have little leftover ends that are called sticky ends because they stick out and therefore they're gonna wanna bind to something and then this will bind to any complementary DNA. There are many different enzymes that can work with this and they're named after the organism that they're found in. For example, these seen here, uh, EcoR1 for example from E. coli. The discovery of restriction enzymes is by these three gentlemen here, and they're named for the, again, from the organism that they came from. ECOR1 is the first restriction enzyme found in E. coli. Again, restriction enzymes cut the DNA at specific sites, leaving the sticky ends. So let's take a look at that. So here we're gonna do some cutting. The restriction enzyme cut site and then you end up with these sequences here and notice the sticky ends. <clears throat> sticky ends will cut the DNA with the same, excuse me, cut other DNA with the same enzymes and we leave the sticky ends on both. So then you can glue the two together at the sticky ends. So you have the gene that you want, the chromosome that you want to add the gene to, and now you have your combined DNA. Notice the color difference. <clears throat> the sticky ends help glue the genes together. So let's watch this sequence here. The cut sites, the gene you want, and then further cut sites. So here's our gene of interest. Now we have the isolated gene with the sticky ends, and these are important because they're gonna allow us to glue that in to a different chromosome. So we take the chromosome that we want to add the gene to and we cut it at the same restriction sites which is going to leave us with sticky ends and then we can glue the sticky ends of the DNA that we want to insert the gene into along with the gene of interest. And we use DNA lig ligase to join the strands and we'll actually be doing this in class. So I really want you to understand this process. So we end up with a recombinant DNA molecule. Well, why do we want to mix genes together to begin with? 
the gene produces a protein in a different organism or even a different individual. So maybe we want <clears throat> to produce human insulin in bacteria. In the past, we got all of our insulin to give to diabetics from pigs because we're very, very similar. But obviously that's a cost to the pig, and if we can have bacteria produce them for us, then that's a better deal. So here's that new protein from the organism, for example, the human insulin protein. We have the bacteria make it for us. Now how can bacteria read human DNA? That seems kind of crazy. Remember this, the genetic code is universal. All organisms use the same DNA, they use the same code, they read their genes in the same way. So that's a pretty handy tool. Moving on. <clears throat> Copy and read DNA. With transformation, we can insert the recombinant plasmid now into the bacteria. So here is your recombinant plasmid. We can grow that recombinant bacteria in agar cultures, which basically gives them the nutrients they need. And the bacteria will make lots of copies of that plasmid for us. In other words, they're cloning it for us, right, because of binary fission. As long as we isolate them from other bacteria, they're going to be cloning and not doing, bringing in any new bacterial genes. So we get the production of many copies of that inserted gene, therefore lots of the new protein in a transformed phenotype. We remember this, DNA to RNA to protein to trait, and so this is the trait, if you will, that we make in the end. So we grow the bacteria, we make more. We take our plasmid, we take that gene from the other organism that we want, we cut it out, and now we stick it in with DNA ligase with our, into our vector. This is our recombinant plasmid, and we put it into our bacteria. They are now transformed. We grow the bacteria, lots of them, and then we harvest and purify the protein. We don't want everything else that they make. Very, very applicable. So what are some uses of genetic engineering, or GMOs, gen genetically modified organisms? <clears throat> we can enable plants to produce new proteins. For example, we can protect crops from insects, Bt corn. This is corn that produces a bacterial toxin, hence the Bt, that controls the corn borer pest. It's a caterpillar that's a pest of corn. So they can produce their own, basically, pesticide. We can also help to extend growing seasons of fish berries. <clears throat> Strawberries with an anti-freezing gene from the flounder. Doesn't a fish berry sound good? So we have an anti-freezing gene in flounder fish that we can then insert into strawberries so that the strawberries don't freeze when the weather starts to turn cold. We can also improve the quality of food. An example there is golden rice. This is a rice that produces vitamin A and improves nutritional value. For example, transgenic rice plant that's been developed here produces yellow grains and it contains beta carotene, that's why it's yellow. And we use beta carotene to make vitamin A. Currently there's about 70% of children under the age of five in the southeastern Asia that are deficient in vitamin A. And this is le leading to vision impairment and even increased rates of other diseases. So if we can offer golden rice, then we can help alleviate that problem. Do you find yourself green with envy? Here are jellyfish with the GFP, it's a, like a glowing protein, and it's been transformed uh, into pigs and mice to let them glow. While our experiment won't be quite as exciting, this is the protein or the gene that we'll be inserting into bacteria and our bacteria will glow. That will be fun. So you cut, paste, copy, find. This is kind of like a word processing metaphor. You cut out the gene that you want with restriction enzymes. You paste it into your vector with ligase. You then copy those plasmids, and this is your bacterial transformation. Is there an easier way? Maybe. We haven't stumbled upon it yet. And then you find whatever that gene is that you're looking for. So make sure your notes are filled out, and when you're ready, move on to the next PowerPoint.